briefly from the CDC, we would get this correspondence back saying, yes, of course, we will cooperate. There's just a few conditions you must abide by. And we look at the conditions. And one of the conditions was you give the CDC final cut. <laughs> well, that wasn't going to happen. We, the scientists, knew what to do for the pandemic response. The plan was in front of us, but leadership would not do it. It is time to lay our careers on the line. This is Doc Dreams. I'm Clayton Davis, Film Awards editor at Variety. Today, I'll be speaking with Alex Gibney, the Oscar-winning documentarian of Taxi to the Dark Side, about his new film, Totally Under Control. There are three directors on Totally Under Control, Ophelia Harutunian, Suzanne Hillinger, and me. We shot about 30 interviews for the doc. We requested as many as 100. The COVID camp was basically invented by our cinematographer, Ben Bloodwell, and it's it's basically a package of a computer, a DSLR camera, and a microphone that we would ship off to locations in a Pelican case. The budget for the documentary was over a million dollars. When did you know you needed to make a documentary about the coronavirus? I had a friend of mine died from COVID. Another friend was on a ventilator for two weeks. And it struck me that the federal response was just terrible. So starting out with that hypothesis, I thought it would be important to do a film about that. And also important that if one was to do that film, to have the film come out prior to the election so that it would be a reckoning with the federal response and holding uh, the president to account. The truth is that political leaders caused avoidable death and destruction. The scientists sounded the alarm every day. The U.S. government was doing nothing. So can you talk about who you reached out to and what was their response? And we're talking as high up as Trump himself. Uh, how far did you go in those asks? We made the asks all the way up to the top, including Trump. Obviously asked for Jared Kushner. We particularly try to get people to talk to us in the CDC, not necessarily at the tippy top, which was Redfield, but, you know, people in the middle or fairly high up, somebody like Nancy Messonnier, we would have loved to have talked to. We went out trying to get everybody. Now, when it came to the Trump administration, they didn't ultimately give us any access. They never told us no, but they just ran out the clock. We also talked to a lot of people off the record. Um, public health officials, people inside the CDC, they were the ones who told us how dangerous it was for them because their phone calls were being monitored by the Trump administration, the emails were being monitored by the Trump administration, they were being spied on. But luckily for us, we also got two whistleblowers, which was a huge breakthrough for us because it puts us inside the administration in a sense of great detail. And that, that was Rick Bright and Max Kennedy. I think when people imagined the federal government response in the war room, they thought it would be this big, you know, energized group of experts, not 10, 20 year old volunteers, all just with private laptops, no industry relationships, no experience working in supply chain. You know, let's go to a, a moment about the volunteers that were in charge of securing PPE, spending all that time and didn't secure one single piece of it the entire time. We were looking for Max, even though we didn't know who Max was because there was an article, uh, two articles, one up in the Post, one in the New York Times, that referred to an anonymous whistleblower. And honestly, his testimony, because it's so dispassionate, um, but so full of detail and a great sense of analysis. It, it was just jaw-dropping to see how utterly uh, incompetent and almost worse than incompetent, because incompetent conveys this idea that that, oh, they just didn't do a good job. This was a task force that was almost intentionally destroying the very task force that they actually created. We could have made a whole film about that. We had some incredible stories that we were never able to include in the final film. The first time Jared Kushner came into the room, he had this big entourage and he said, I want to make this as effective as possible. Tell me the problems that you have and I will solve them today. And we said, we need to be able to pay up front. And he said, done. But there was no action taken that we saw whatsoever. In the entire time that I was a volunteer, our team did not directly purchase a single mask. When is the moment that you knew you had something substantial? I think it was the interview with Dr. Rick Bright. When he finally agreed to sit down with us, and I think it was a five, possibly six hour interview. Once that was in the can, we knew we had a, a film. 
because he takes us inside on a day-by-day basis. And we had a conception of the film early on that we were going to try to treat everything. We were going to focus on the early days of the pandemic. That was super important to us because that's when things could have been different. If this drug works, it will be wonderful. It'll be so beautiful. It'll be a gift from heaven. I lost it. I lost all respect for that chain of command, for that security that we as Americans have put in those people. The hardest day from a documentary filmmaking perspective was when we had a cut that was two and a half hours long and it didn't contain, you know, the final act. And we only had about three or four weeks left before we were, we needed to be finished. (laughs) You've got very little time left, but you think there may be key structural problems. And then to have the courage to fix those structural problems, to say, no, no, this section actually doesn't go here. We're going to move that 20 minutes further down and move this other section up here. And if we do that, the flow is going to be much better. Editing schedule that's nine months, that's a routine thing to do. But when you're facing such a tense and tight deadline, those are the kinds of things that that uh, make your skin crawl. Because if you get that wrong, you've wasted a tremendous amount of time. There's all this pressure to start moving to fine cut, to, to, to make everything look pretty. Once it was revealed that Bob Woodward had spoken to Donald Trump on February 7th, and he revealed to him that he knew how deadly was the virus. We knew we had to put it in the film, but the question is, where do we put it in the film? Do we put it in the chronological flow? There was another place we thought to put it, or do we put it at the very end and then rewind back to the beginning as if to say, you know, here's the final reckoning. Did this guy really know how bad it was? And that, in fact, is exactly what we did. This is where we finally came out. You know, what did the president know and when did the president know it? The words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all. And it's going to be just fine. Whatever happens, we're totally prepared. The final title card is profound. (laughs) Trump test positive the day after this. Was there a moment when you were like, oh, my God, we need to turn the cameras back on? When I'm in the middle of a film like this, it's very difficult for me to sleep soundly because I take problems to bed with me and they roll around in my head uh, and I wake up sometimes with a solution, sometimes with just more anxiety. And in this case, on a Thursday night, I remember sleeping so soundly because we had finally locked picture and we were done. And, And we decided we had to be done in order to make our delivery date great. All good. Then at 2 a.m. that morning, I got a call. Trump has tested positive for coronavirus. And by the way, uh, later on that morning, we were supposed to drop our trailer. And the question was, do we not drop the trailer because the president is now sick? And ultimately came up with a solution that incorporated it, but also acknowledged it as part of the end of our film. Who's tougher, Scientology or the Trump administration? Oh, man. I got more cards and letters from the church in Scientology. (laughs) I didn't get that much real contact from the Trump administration. One is creepier. One is obviously far more dangerous. And the one that's far more dangerous is the Trump administration. And that's ultimately where we came out on this one was that this was a crisis that didn't have to happen. And these were deaths that didn't have to happen. And these deaths were in some ways intentional by virtue of political expediency. And that was really the most terrifying thing of all. So if you're thinking about what's dangerous, that's pretty dangerous. 200,000 plus people die because of a political calculation. Do you take responsibility? No, I don't take responsibility at all. We've never had a failure like this. We have it totally under control. 